When you played in the 70s here in Milwaukee, what was it like being a black athlete in this city? Well, you know, Stephen, um, but back in those days, there was an unwritten quota system, especially in Midwest cities like Kansas City, Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, where you would have six, no more than six black players, six white players on the 12-man squad. When I was drafted uh, by the Milwaukee Bucks, there was a big, big clamor around the league that the league, the NBA, was, uh, was too black, too many black faces is what they were saying in the media, just saying it, you know, just out there. And so the Bucks um, had the number one pick, and so they drafted Kent Benson because the league wanted white superstars. Um, you know, Kent Benson was drafted as the number one pick. I was drafted number three. I didn't go number two to Kansas City because Kansas City had a really good small forward by the name of Scott Webb. His teammate was a college teammate of mine by the name of Richard Washington. He told management, look, Marcus is better than Scott Webman. But, but Scott Webman, Kansas City, Midwest, the quota system, he kind of fit the profile of what they needed. So my point is, is that it wasn't just overt racism, but there were some racial components going on. Uh, I remember Don Nelson, when after my second year, averaged uh, 26 points a game almost, first team all pro, one of the top five players in the world. Nelly asked me to scale my scoring back from 26 a game to 20 points a game. Now, my point is... Don Nelson, not a racist bone in his body, but the racial component, I believe that if I would have been a white forward, that the league would have intervened and said, well, you know, why is this kid only averaging 20 after averaging 26 as a second-year player? We need, we need our superstars. You know, you got to let him shoot more. And so I, you know, there are racial components, but in terms of overt racism in this city, for me, the, the, the episodes were few and far between, and uh, I've always thoroughly enjoyed and respected and, 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 and liked being a part of this city. What does it say about not only the Milwaukee Bucks and this city, but also the league to see the way that they have addressed racism over the last six months? Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it even goes on before that. And, and, and you, you look at Adam Silver, and you look at the uh, situation with the Clippers, my former owner, Donald Sterling, who was a nightmare to play for. Uh, you know, he would have uh, his friends come into the locker room and we're all standing around after games butt naked and they would just sit there and, you know, just admire our bodies and look at us and we felt like slaves on the auction block. I mean, a lot of that kind of stuff was going on with Donald Sterling back in those days. I need to write a book about it and probably will. But but uh, I just respect the fact that Adam Silver, after Donald Sterling made some of the disparaging remarks he made about Magic Johnson, racial, racially tinged remarks, had swift and decisive action and got him out of the league. And so that's, uh, that's where it kind of started in terms of where this commissioner and the hierarchy of the NBA, I think what their attitude about race was going to be about. To have what happened last summer, to have uh, the league support the players in terms of some of the stances that, that they took during that, uh, that summer of discontent of 2020, uh, to me says a lot about this league and their sensitivity. It's a primary black league, and this league is has thrived because of the contributions of African-Americans on so many different levels. And for the league to reciprocate that respect and gratitude by some of their actions, actions is always the key word to me is uh, really gratifying as a former player. Marcus, I believe it was in June I spoke to Kareem about this topic, and he used the quote, caught between hope and history when discussing racism in America. Do you see the type of progress that you were hoping to see from well, when yes you were and, a player to, to now? Well, yes and no. I mean, there's still some attitudes. And, and, and what's happened is that, for example, when Barack Obama was elected uh, president in 2008, a lot of people thought that that was going to be the beginning of hope and change. And it wasn't. What it was, was uh, I thought, was a mirror put up reflecting the attitudes of a lot of people in this country. And there were a lot of people upset that we had an African-American president and then uh, we had a black man living in the White House. Uh, uh, and, and whether that um, discontent because of that was, was, uh, was uh, expressed openly or, 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 or quietly or subconsciously, I think it was still there. Uh, so from that standpoint, um, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done, but you're not going to have the kind of progress that we're looking for until we pull that scab off and that's going to and that's the part we're going through now it's painful uh, it, it's confrontational to me there's no growth without pain 
And so now we're going through the pain of kind of confronting a lot of the stuff that has been percolating right below the surface for years that people have had blinders to willingly and unwillingly. But now things are starting to be placed out in the open where we can look at them, talk about them, evaluate them, evaluate them. And then uh, I, I really hope and pray move forward in a positive direction because of it. Now, Marcus was on the call of the Bucks playoff game they boycotted this summer in Orlando. Johnson saying on the air that night that he was proud of that group for their decision, adding, quote, if not you, then who? If not now, then when?